Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, proud to be the incoming president of the New America Foundation. My panel, uh, you have, I'm not going to do any introductions except to say on my right is Eric Schmidt, on his right is Rebecca McKinnon, on, his, on her right uh, is Sasha Meinrath, uh, and uh, my, the anchor at the other end is Jean Kimmelman. Wow. Uh, and this is a panel on the digital age, the new dig digital age. It's actually an unpanel. Uh, at least uh, when we were in the State Department, we did unconferences, and this is an unpanel uh, in the sense that we are not uh, going to each present something uh, and then have you ask questions, but we're going to start a conversation. I will start by asking questions, and then we're going to turn it over uh, to all of you and run this as much as a, a collective conversation uh, as we can. Uh, I thought, of course, since the new digital age is the title uh, of uh, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen's uh, best-selling new book, that we could actually ask Eric for a book talk and all drink our coffee for 45 minutes. But he has done this in his sleep, so we're going to see if we can't mix it up a little bit, uh, although I strongly do recommend the, the book, and not just because he's the chairman of the board. <laughs> But you were one of the three people who actually read it and reviewed it and <laughs> gave us a lot of help, and you're heavily credited as one of the ass assistant author type people. It is. So it, you really have read the book. book. I really have it. read the book. That is true, and, and it's a, an excellent book. So actually, let me start by asking, uh, and we'll go down the row. If I'm trying to explain the new digital age to my mother, she understands, as I think most people understand, that it's about new communication. Right, that it's people think about digital and they think about communication, they think about the internet, uh, and that's really what they associate uh, with the idea of the digital age. How do we communicate, how do you communicate the idea that it's so much more than that, that really being able to make things digital is transforms everything we can do, not simply the way in which we communicate, that it's, it's much, much more than the internet age. Uh, first, on, on behalf of the board, I cannot tell you how excited we are to have Emory as our incoming president. The, if you look at the choices that you face, you always choose her first. And after months and months of trying to convince her of this, she came to the same reasoning. So I think I can say very clearly that this is going to be a very good decade uh, for New America. You know, over my entire professional career, the core story has been the digital age and how technology is changing things and empowering people. And today, most people of a certain age think of the empowerment revolution as texting, communications, and so forth. And that's very real, uh, but that's a 1% you know, story. What, what the real story is, is the union and empowerment model that comes from a new model of computing, which is mobile devices and cloud computing, which is the back end of servers, the combination of those two creates ultimately an infinitely intelligent personal digital assistant that literally, again, all opt in with your permission, all that kind of stuff, that helps you out in every way, in every day, in every aspect of your life. What should I go? What, what should I do? Where should I go? What should I think? What are my ideas? What should I say? Did I say something wrong? Et cetera, et cetera. And that transformation is much, much more than any of the examples that are in the conversation today. It's much more than Google and Facebook and so forth. It's a change of life. If you want to understand this, watch the movie L.A. Story or Manhattan from 25 years ago and recognize that they don't text, they don't have Google, they don't have the Internet. You forget how much our daily intellectual lives the way we communicate, the way we understand, our knowledge, the way we behave politically has changed. In that period, now fast forward 20 years, think about how much, when we look back at this period, how we will look ignorant to ourselves. We'll say, we knew nothing. Where was X, Y, and Z that would have told us this, that would have anticipated this? And modern computing, at least for the wealthier parts of the world, can anticipate what you need, figure out where to get it for you, and help manage your life in a way that's much, much better. Great. Thank you. Rebecca. Well, just um, in short, I, I think one of, one of the things we, we need to recognize is that while the Internet has been tremendously empowering uh, in many ways, it's not automatic freedom juice. It's not automatic democracy <laughs> tonic. You know, add Internet, society becomes more democratic. Add Internet, 
dictators fall and democracy th flourishes. That it, it depends. And, and I think Eric's book, um, I think, outlined a number of the ways in which, of course, a lot of bad people are empowered by technology to, to do troubling things. And there are a lot of power struggles going on in the digital world over you know, who has the advantage. But I, I think that the key thing is, is that if we, if we want the internet, if we want digitally networked technologies to, involve, to evolve in a manner that is maximally compatible with democracy, that is maximally compatible with protection of human rights and respect for human rights and, and the holding of power accountable, um, we have to work at it because our digitally networked spaces and platforms are an extension of society. They're an extension of, of, of human, oh, I didn't have my mic all that time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I hope Did you anybody all heard the part me? about it's not <laughs> automatic freedom um, juice. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, that our digitally net network spaces are, are an extension of our society. And just as, uh, you know, in, in any space, uh, there's going to be lots of different actors seeking to shape that space to their greatest advantage. Uh, and if we don't engage, um, then those who engage the most will, of course, shape that space to, to their greatest advantage. And there are a lot of challenges in, in terms of, you know, not only are governments, of course, seeking increasingly, you know, I think in the first decade of the internet, governments didn't really notice what happened. And now, as, as Eric wrote, you know, they're acting to, to, to really try and seize control of a lot of things. Uh, but we have new types of corporate sovereignties as, as well. You know, not the same kind of, of sovereignty as a nation state, but still, you know, uh, our lives, our digital lives are mediated through uh, privately owned uh, platforms uh, and and through tools developed by private companies and so so that if if the if these networks are going to evolve in a manner that's compatible with democracy with human rights we need a very strong commitment from these companies to the values of human rights civil liberties and democracy and to ensure that uh, these platforms do not become opaque extensions of government power or end up being uh, platforms through which kind of abusive power uh, can be obscured because we don't know what's going on. So how do we make sure that the exercise of power in the digital world uh, is, it can be understood and held accountable and that we have the mechanisms to do that. And, and that is, is one of, I think, the, the challenges going forward that amidst all the excitement of, of what is possible um, and this entire new frontier that has been opened up, uh, that, that we make sure we have the right mechanisms and approaches. And I don't think sort of traditional politics and geopolitics have been equipped uh, to, to really figure out um, if the purpose of governance is to, um, of course, enable interests uh, uh, to, to be represented and also to constrain against abuse and, and hold people accountable, um, how do we do that in a globally networked world? And how do we ensure that the Internet evolves in a way that really respects uh, and reflects the, the rights and interests of, of everybody on the network and not just sort of the, the most powerful and influential. And that's, that's a big challenge. So if you hear a certain creative tension here uh, between the first two answers, that's part of what New America is about. And I'm going to give ask Eric, uh, after we've, we've heard from our other two panelists, to respond in part in terms of how we actually hold uh, the major players uh, in the digital age accountable. Uh, but just a couple of points. So Eric, Eric started by describing it as an empowerment revolution. Uh, and Rebecca, you point out, yeah, well, it empowers lots and lots and lots of different people, and they're not all good, which uh, Eric's book very much uh, recognizes. I guess the question I'm still pushing on, though, and, and Rebecca, the way you you framed it, brought that out. The, the common skeptic, the skeptic, the internet skeptic just says, yeah, 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 this is the latest advance in degree, but not in kind, right? This is the latest communications advance. I mean, if you looked back 20 years before you had the telephone, you would have something similar, uh, you know, that we've, human, humans have always found ways to communicate that seem radically different than other ways. But this 
is more, right, than, than just the, the ways in which uh, we communicate. The, I, it's, it's in many ways, I think, what Eric is arguing, a real difference in kind, right? It's, a complete, it's, it's really a different world that is nonlinear uh, from, from the way humans have progressed uh, before. So, Sasha, you're on the cutting edge of a lot of that. Um, so, again, what, what is it really that, that makes the digital age different? So I agree with Eric, and I agree with Rebecca, and I guess my, I would iterate maybe through things that I think they might then end up agreeing with me as well. Oh, no, we need some disagreement. And, but here, here's the thing. We're not in the new digital age yet. Can you hear Right, there's a tiny number of people on the planet that get to take advantage of all of what the digital era might become. And in essence, we're right now at this battleground between the end of a broadcast era and something different in communications. We're right at the end of a manufacturing, you know, physical widget era and something different. And the potential is definitely there for something that's decentralized and participatory and empowering. But the, what we're actually in the midst of is this huge fight against this ossified, centralized, backward-thinking, cold warrior mentality that spans across a huge number of different domains. And it's not clear not just who's going to win, but what the outcome might look like. Now, I think that the outcome looks like this mess that we're seeing in a number of areas that I call digital feudalism. Where in some ways you have all the freedom in the world as long as you're within the confines that are constructed for you. And you see this in the devices that everyone's using here. You have certain functionality that's just not in them. You see that in the video codec that's being used, which is proprietary. You see that in what you can and cannot access online. We talk about how China makes everyone a criminal so that anyone can be arbitrarily and capriciously locked up. I'd be willing to bet all of you are copyright pirates and criminals in your own like. And it becomes a mechanism whereby we can exert power arbitrarily and capriciously as needed to control your behavior. To me, that's a very scary, very real, very probable outcome unless we change the trajectory of what this digital era might look like. So I think there's absolutely this potential for this force multiplier effect for participatory democracy. I'm also very keenly aware that more and more these enclosures are happening, you know, chains of silver that prevent us from ever achieving that utopian kind of future and keep us locked into models that really are quite destructive and quite anti-democratic. Wow. Uh, so wait a minute. We, I thought I was, I was feeling deeply empowered and suddenly I'm a vassal. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a vassal, and I didn't even realize I'd sworn fealty to my particular baron. Okay, we're, we're going to ask, we're, we're, we're going to need a response. It, so, Gene, you're the director of the Internet Freedom and Human Rights Project. So when I hear that, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be in the State Department when Secretary Clinton gave her Internet Freedom speeches, and really I remember sitting downstairs in the museum and listening to her at her first speech, which was January 2010, and it's really one of the few moments uh, when I was in the State Department where I really felt like I was touching history. I really thought, you know, she is the first person to articulate this new frontier as a human rights frontier. But, you know, when I listen to Sasha, I think, well, so we could, we could have a whole internet enlightenment that is going to take us uh, out of feudalism uh, as we did in, in uh, regular history. But the other part of me wonders, gee, is the, is the you know, are the traditional structures of human rights, you know, the way we would normally tackle this kind of question in a democracy, which is to secure individual rights against governments, is that, is that remotely capable, those traditional approaches of tackling the kind of challenges that, that both Sasha and Rebecca just outlined? In the same way that every other age has tackled them, because it's all about power. There's nothing different other than we call it the digital age, and it has certain attributes. You, you, you launched this by saying, so what would your mother say of this? Poor mother. <laughs> so um, uh, I'll give my mother Eric's book. Um, she'll read it. 
And I can guarantee you that my typewriting mother, who has never used a computer, will be just totally um, uh, lost at sea thinking this is science fiction. It's like every science fiction book she's ever read and every movie she's ever seen on one level because it's technology she doesn't understand. Um, at the same time, she's someone who has fought against genocide her entire adult life. And she'll look at this and say, isn't this about all the same fights that we've been having in country after country, regime after regime, for our entire history? And I, I use that to respond to you as, as I think, of the, the example that this is a game changer. I think Eric is very right in the sense of the enormous explosive opportunities and dangers that come with digitization that may be a, a leapfrogging of technology compared to what we've seen in the past. Who knows what will come next? And I think in that sense, Sasha is also right that we haven't seen it yet in implementation form in society. Um, and I think Rebecca is absolutely right that there are, it's about power and it's about the kinds of entities that, that have power in our world. Uh, both private and public. Um, and yet it's not really a change in kind because in the end it is that fight about who controls what and how, whether we go back more towards broadcast type thinking or towards a totally different type of thinking. And to me what's critical is that we need policymakers to understand what they're playing with. So when Secretary Clinton gives that speech, which is inspiring, and begins to capture the potential of the future, um, I think it's the tip of the iceberg as to what we need to look at for whether this can actually harness technology for good. Because unless policymakers throughout our systems across countries understand both the potential and the danger, uh, we, we, have, we, have, we have no idea how this will play out. So. So I want to come back, Eric, I want to come back to you and ask you in part to respond to the the much more fettered vision of the world, uh, I think, that both Re Rebecca and, and uh, Sasha put forward. But to, to Aunt Dean, so one, my immediate response when I hear that, and I think you're, I mean, power is eternal, right? I mean, in what the, the struggle for power is, eter is eternal, but... You know, knowledge is power, right? Knowledge is deeply power. And for the first time ever, you know, we, subject to the digital divide, but, but assuming we, are, we were, are, are expanding that as rapidly as possible, individuals have knowledge at their fingertips that they could never have had before. I mean, this has totally changed the power at my dinner table. My 16-year-old can now tell me I'm wrong and prove it because he Googled it. So... Just a minor example, but one that's ever present in my mind. Uh, so, but so doesn't isn't that a step change? It's a step change, but it's um, the same capacity for that information is equaled by its capacity for misinformation. In the same country that you find shutting down the internet or any communications platform, you see increasingly equal efforts to flood the communications platform with all kinds of alternative information that you may find to be total falsehood. And so your struggle is going to be that eternal struggle we have had in different times of how to sift through that and how to have a rational discussion of where to take that. And I do think that is the traditional power struggle. Okay. Why don't you... you I'm not going to keep calling on you. Respond and, and uh, respond, and then we're, I'm going to start bringing in um, other voices. Um, it's helpful, I think, as Jean, as you put it out, what is new as opposed to what is traditional? And what is new is the empowerment of billions of people with simultaneous access to things, with cameras and the ability to search and know an opinion and be manipulated and be good and bad. That is, in fact, what's new. Um, as Sasha said, this is a, a shift from the broadcast model to an individual model, and that is profound. Another thing that's new uh, which we don't talk about very much, is the advent of modern cryptographics. And modern cryptographics, properly done, allow a private communication between two people that's not, that an intermediary cannot uh, intervene in. That's quite new in the sense that if you go back to small towns a couple hundred years ago, there was no such thing. Right? And under, underlying this cryptography is a, a, a notion of strong privacy. 
So this has a lot of implications for how governments will behave in the eternal power struggle that I think you mentioned. So in Sasha's case, and I agree basically with Rebecca's framing, I should say, in Sasha's case, the, the problem with the sort of the, um, the, the old to new transition that he talks about that many, many people would like to see um, is that there are also bad actors in the new model. And so you, at, at every level, the reason the old system worked is it policed the bad actors and it, it, uh, uh, it rewarded the people in power then. In the new model, you still have a problem of policing the bad actors. And so in a truly peer-to-peer -peer ad hoc model of how the world will work, which is very technologically attractive, you still have the problem of what do you do when two terrorists find each other and these sorts of things. And the reason to be pessimistic about that is to say that in the fight between hawks and doves, which goes on in every society all the time, eventually the hawks seem to win. It takes a special country, a special belief system, a special set of leaders to not give in to the immediacy of, oh, you know, here's this. So here was this crime, we'll ban this, right? And America is quite guilty of overreaction in many, many cases of things which other countries would, would have said, okay, this is really terrible, but, you know, it's a cost of life, let's police it in some other way. And so again, I don't, I don't know that we're a better model of it, but I, I would say that, that having a, a sort of a reasoned reaction to this empowerment model will turn out to be an important predictor of future success. Hmm. You know, do you overreact, do you underreact? Yeah, I mean, just speaking to the sort of in information abundance thing, um, a good friend of mine, Rosenthal Alves, who teaches journalism at the University of Austin, uh, of Texas at Austin, likes to talk about the pre-internet age as an information desert, right? It, it was an economy, it was, it, it was a power structure, a structure of governance entirely adapted and having evolved for a very long time around the scarcity of water. And all the organisms, you know, societies were all built around that principle. Suddenly, the deluge came. We're now in the Amazon rainforest. There's an abundance of water, an abundance of food, also a massive abundance of new pred predators and all kinds of new organi organisms. And you've got the, the organisms and the, those who benefited from the power structures of the desert society trying to maintain, uh, you know, their you know, structures and organisms that were optimized for the desert in the rainforest, and they're trying to kill things that are challenge threatening their power in the rainforest and not succeeding very well, but trying very hard. And and so so there there's an issue of you know a need to adapt both economically uh, and politically and in, in, in terms of the way in which society is organized to, to adapt to a completely different environment. And, and there's a huge struggle going on. But see, I think it's precisely because of that we need to think about how to educate policymakers immediately. Because I think the, the predominant model I've experienced in 30 years in Washington is that people make policy looking through the rearview mirror. They're constantly looking at what they've experienced, what they've seen, and trying to fix everything going backwards. And so if you take new technology and you take this leapfrogging potential, that becomes more problematic than maybe anything we've seen in our previous lifetimes um, of the ability to make mistakes in policy because you're missing opportunities. You're missing what, I've no, I've no doubt the market can innovate. I've no doubt there are a lot of bright people who can come up with wonderful ideas in the marketplace. The real question is can policymakers take advantage of that to promote something good as opposed to bad or will they just be so afraid that they'll shut it down and go backwards because that's their natural inclination and I think that's where we have the largest problem both in this country and, and around the world uh, to deal with. Well, to, to just jump in there on the cryptography point. So the FBI has a proposal to, to basically make the kind of cryptography you're talking about illegal, <laughs> you know, and requiring back doors uh, in, in tools uh, and technologies so that people won't be able to fully encrypt their, their communications, so that it can be wiretapped, so that terrorists can be caught. So, so you know, the, the question is, and of course engineers have come out saying this is ultimately going to make us less secure in the first place, but this is a perfect example of people you know, backward thinking about how to preserve their power and do policy in a new environment that just doesn't work anymore. You have a history here as well in that 
a quarter century ago we fought the crypto wars, there was a question whether you had a right, all of you, to encrypt, period. Because for the first time we were able to secure communications in a way. And the way this got operationalized and brought to the fore is um, Windows and the, the browser that allowed for you to do a secure communications, i.e. put your credit card online, contained strong encryption, which until 96 was still classified as a munition, such that every person that was bringing their laptop out of the country was literally violating munitions transport laws of the United States of America. And so the solution that we came up with is, well, that's crazy. We've now criminalized like every business traveler on the planet, so we're going to fix this, right? Except we never did fix it. So fast forward to today, our team is putting together a bunch of encryption work using elliptical curved cryptography. It encrypts very well, thank you. <laughs> and it's now classified once again as too strong, too secure to be moved into countries where we're planning to work. And so now I have to fight a bunch of battles trying to figure out how to change policy again over the exact same thing. And luckily this time we have people like Chris Riley over there who's like, yeah, we do need to change this. <laughs> Let's figure out a way to do that. But there's a bigger problem at play. There's an unholy alliance right now happening. The reason why network neutrality matters and internet freedom matters to every single one of you is that we're heading into a future where privacy and speed become a trade-off. So if I'm allowed to discriminate against an application or service on all of your internet service providers, they all want this to be the case. Well, then the logical thing for me to do, if I'm the discriminated service or application, is to encrypt it so you can't tell what that is. Well, fast forward a few iterations of this, and it's like if everyone starts encrypting, then you no longer can discriminate against a particular service type or et cetera. Now everything's encrypted. And so the only way you can monitor and surveil, the only way law enforcement and copyright holders and the ISPs, that unholy trifecta, can control and commoditize our communications. Which was the trifecta again? I missed one. The law I enforcement, copyright holders, and the ISPs themselves, the internet service providers. <laughs> The unholy trifecta, okay. <laughs> the only way they can commoditize different services is to say, look, if you encrypt, if you secure your communications, if you want privacy, that traffic is going to be deprioritized writ large. It is the logical outcome of the trajectory that we're on right now. Eric, do you agree? Uh, that's one scenario. I, there's a lot of implications from the way Sasha set that up, including how you feel about, pri uh, about copyright law. So I'll let you articulate those arguments. I'm for copyright law. I'm for sanity of copyright law as well. <laughs> you know, I, I like, you know, everyone harkens back on like, oh, the founding, far founding fathers, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, copyright, 14 years. You know, I actually have a copy of the Constitution in my bag. It says Doesn't copyright. Everyone? To promote science <laughs> and the useful arts, we're good to put in place for a limited time copyright. Well, de facto, that's gone out the window completely and utterly. That's not saying copyright. So I wanna, I'm going to open it up. I want, I want uh, questions. Uh, let, let me see if I can pull some of this uh, together. Not easy. I mean, so part of it, what we're seeing are where are the new frontiers, right? They are around privacy for sure, intellectual property, um, accountability, right? So to, to go back to, you know, how are we going to ensure in this space where, where again, the, the idea of an empowerment revolution, how does that actually become freedom juice to put, to put but, but in the sense that we, we think of in a democratic society, how do you ensure that that empowerment is empowering the right people and allowing them to hold the powerful accountable? That's what a, the backbone of a democracy uh, is. So those are, are three quite 
I mean, those are those are three sets of issues, and and I would put the the the, the accountability frontier as part of the human rights. That's always been what human rights is about. In part, it's it's holding the powerful accountable so they don't abuse their power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, individuals. I guess I still. You know, the question I started with is, you know, is there a way that we can think about this that is not looking backwards? I mean, Gene, you said, of course, we policymakers make policy looking backwards and generals fight the last wars. Well, because we're not, you know, we're not seers, right? We're, we are imprisoned by our own experience inevitably. That's why we constantly look for analogies, right? In foreign policy, you know, right now I'm fighting on, on you know, what do we do in Syria? Well, is Syria Kosovo or is Syria Iraq? Is, you know, it's it's we we as human beings have to reason backwards to move forwards. We have to find analogies to move forward, and yet you have this sense in reading Eric's book, reading the certainly the work that OTI is doing, that we're really. Rebecca, as you said, you know, in this world where what, what once was scarce is now radically abundant, and things are possible that even science fiction writers would have had a hard time uh, imagining. And I guess my, my question then is, is there a framework for policy making that allows people to look forward without, without being, being uh, chained by, by what, what's gone before? I mean, it really does feel, that's why I said, a difference in kind and not a difference in degree. I think you suggested it already. Um, to put, as you said, what Secretary Clinton did was new, creative, innovative. It was, I th would say, a first in U.S. policy to put a human rights frame around what have traditionally been commercial issues. And I think that elevates the debate in the right way. It doesn't solve the problem. You need, um, you need um, an educated set of intermediaries, of uh, curators, of those who help bring technical issues down to a very concrete level for the public and for policymakers. But if you do it in a human rights frame, I think we're in the right space going forward. Because you're putting a seriousness and a depth to this that I think is truly reflective of what the power of communications is today in the digital age. Rebecca, you, you're frowning, and then I'm going to call on Steve well, no. Clements. And you don't have to ask a question. You can make a comment, a, a succinct and, and scintillating comment. Um, <laughs> But so, uh, go ahead, Rebecca, and then uh, I'll sure. call Sure, I, I, I actually totally I, I agree with Jean. Um, and uh, speaking of looking backward to look forward, as, as I wrote in my book that in a year and a half hasn't sold nearly as well as Eric's already has. Um, it's a great book. Uh, uh, we're, we're at a Magna Carta moment. Um, in that, you know, th there was a point in history when nobody could think of any other way to organize power than a king whose power was divinely anointed, right? And nobody had any concept of any other model of governance. And over time, that shifted. It started with a bunch of barons saying, this is crap. You know, the king has to be accountable to some basic you know, agreements, otherwise he's illegitimate. That didn't end up turning out so well, but over time, it evolved to the concept of consent of the governed, it, you know, which came out as a concept first and then took a while to actually, you know, be, actually have a society attempt to implement it for the first time. Uh, and of, of course, then sort of be adopted widely around the world as sort of the, the basis uh, for governance. But we're sort of at, at, at a new point where people are kind of, I think, starting to realize are the assumed way, the way we assumed is sort of the best way to organize power and governance um, isn't working so well for us anymore in the globally digitally networked age. Um, but we haven't yet gotten to the, you know, John Locke consent of the governed moment where somebody's really articulated sort of what the new approach is, let alone the American Revolution model or the other kind of failed attempts at revolution before that. Um, you know, th there's going to be a process. And because of the digital age, it'll obviously be accelerated. But it but needs we're to be. In, <laughs> uh, but we're, we're in a very kind of messy time when we're going, oh, you know, the old ways of, of doing governance ain't working so well for us anymore, but it's going to take a while. You know, here, we, here we are in D.C. where we're always complaining about our government. Trust me, after the 30 countries that Jared and I went to, we've got a pretty good one compared to a lot of the other ones. Um, imagine Pakistan, right, 
or India or, you know, go through the places that we went or countries that don't, don't seem to have a government at all. Um, it's fun, as, per, as an amateur in this, you guys are more of the professionals uh, in this area, is do thought experiments about societies that could be formed with all these new tools. So you know, we did a thought experiment, which was just a joke, uh, of a country which we named Wikistan, which uh, was organized around the, com the, the, the Constitution forced everything to be leaked all the time. So the problem with this society, which is one of these sort of pseudo-Scandinavian countries you've always heard about, very nice, very thoughtful, you know, very successful country. Everything, the government never keeps any secrets. People have secrets, but the government doesn't. So eventually, the country next door decides to give them a secret because they know it'll get leaked. And then eventually, there's a conflict between this Wikistan virtual country and some other country where they actually have to do something that's secret, like bomb them, right? But they're required to reveal their bombing targets before they launch the bombs. So <laughs> these facetious examples I think point out the, the conundrum that every society has. You can do a similar one where imagine an ad hoc country, right? So everyone is ad hoc, right? So you have, basically you show up, you become a member of the country, and your mobile phone tells you your rights. And they're, they're pickup games, right? So the phone sort of says, this is what you can do, this is, and you start off with every right. So then how do you determine when the bad person comes in, which rights for them, right? Like the rights of evil plotting, are, and if you go through that thought experiment long enough, you discover that you're surveilling the citizens to figure out if they're legitimate or not in an ad hoc country, which is precisely the thing an ad hoc country cannot do. So uh, what you discover is, again, there are these fundamental oppositional questions. The empowerment of the individual empowers the good people and the bad people. The empowerment of the government allows the government to survey the people. Even with a shift of power, the government has tools. Now, obviously, in a case like the Boston bombings, we want the government to have the power to go find these two evil people, right? So we're not arguing against that. The question is, where's that limit? Each society, what I've learned, as, again, as an amateur in this space, is that every country has a cultural and historical answer to this, and they're not the same. So it's perfectly possible that the real tension is going to be between the state of the Internet, which is sort of this virtual country that everybody thinks they live in, and physical space, and each keeps the other in check. Right, that if you, if you behave very badly in physical space, like you start doing genocide and things like this, um, which is obviously a terrible thing, the internet community will help put pressure on you to stop. You see this in China with the Weibo, uh, where the train accident. And they covered it up, they buried the train, the whole bit, all these sort of terrible government behaviors. <coughs> Citizens revolted on Weibo, and eventually the fellow running the, the, the railroad is now in jail for, for corruption and, in fact, under a death sentence. Um, you see this in, in cyberspace when you see humans doing things which, which are illegal, should be illegal, and we don't want them to do. In cyberspace, people in physical space come and visit them in their houses and arrest them. The two keep each other in check in a complicated dance that's not fully understood. Great. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. It's a fascinating discussion. It's very interesting to me to see how your discussion about the digital world uh, is replicating foreign policy discussions. You know, Eric sounds to me like a Nixonian realist, uh, uh, you is know, a, 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 a digital a realist. And, and Sasha <laughs> That's sounds Henry like Kissinger. Digital, it's not bad company. You know, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I, okay, I'm I'll saying that as a compliment, compliment for anyone who uh, who knows knows me. I, I admired uh, Nixonian realism, but Sasha sounds like the digital Wilsonian or digital uh, socialist or the digital liberal interventionist. I don't know what to call it, but but it does sound interesting that there's a very big gap and. You know, I think in the net neutrality debate, one of the things I could never understand about the net neutrality question is that this world has been built largely out of massive investment, massive uh, investment in, in, in property rights that you needed to, you know, uh, innovators are running towards this because they want to get wealthy and rich, and they're not running toward it because they want to, to, to create a world of, of digital freedom juice. I mean, it, it's, there seems to be a tension between the public goods benefits that I think Sasha is trying to raise as a somewhat of a fundamental right and the, the real public goods returns that a private company like Google has been able to achieve. And so you've got these clashing and interesting worldviews. So I just want to put on the table that, that I do think that there's a big fundamental debate out there on, on which of these visions delivers more ultimately. And then Sasha's comment about digital feudalism was interesting because unless you have the rise of the digerati or the public, which you know often doesn't happen in transitions from feudal orders, you have essentially a lord who takes over. If you read Eric's book and you, you look at the balkanization uh, concerns that he has about uh, the digital universe and the balkanization of that or what China is doing today versus, say, what the West uh, is doing, you know, fundamentally it looks like 
you know, a Darwinian battle. And that, and that, you know, that is essentially when you describe a feudal lord, what you're, what you're, you know, describing is one of them, like in the Tokugawa regime or something is going to knock out all the rest or absorb all the rest. And that's a very different picture than this kind of, you know, fuzzy vision that we're all going to be digitally free. And I wanted to ask Sasha maybe to develop that a little bit further. Is that how you see your mission fundamentally as, as a, uh, you know, missionary or a, you know, a, a spear carrier for the sort of American version of, of this stuff as you go into other countries in the world. Do you see it in that way that, that you're, you're, you've got one fiefdom and you're under control and you're going to spread that fiefdom? Uh, so, I'm, Sasha, I'm going to let you answer. There's uh, someone over here is going to ask the, and the next question. Actually, we've got two. Uh, so th just to get to get the microphone there, hold it, hold. Uh, and Sasha, I'm gonna let you answer, but I think in part Rebecca answered because she said we're at a Magna Carta moment. Sasha talked about the barons, so we're just gonna put this together, right? We're, we're, we're gonna break the chains uh, with, a, with a Magna Carta for the consent of the network. Yeah, I mean, look, throughout history, most serfs had no idea who their lord was. Right, you talk to people in Somalia today, they don't know what lo warlord is running that piece of territory. It's not that you have to be self-aware to know that something is in control and it isn't you. Most of us aren't aware of all the different ways in which our actions are being prescribed or controlled or what have you. I think it, that isn't enough. I think because of these strong economic interests, uh, without active resistance, we end up further and further entrenched into systems, ecosystems, that are not necessarily meeting our best interests. And I think the same can be said in, in terms of like that technical realm, in terms of our geopolitical realm, right? I, I think we're sort of like, it's very easy for us here in America to be sort of modern day Osmandiuses, right? And we don't say, look at us and tremble, we say, look at us, we're awesome. And I don't think that history will look too kindly at what we've crafted here. I hope not. I hope we look back and we're like, wow, look at those poverty rates. Look at the infant mortality rates. Look at the wealth divides. Look at the way in which we bomb the crap out of everyone on the planet whenever we seem to feel like it. Those aren't the marks of a civil society. And in fact, there's never been, a, where I'm hopeful is there's never been a point where we've actually achieved the end result. And I hope we don't get there anytime soon because that would probably be annihilation at this point in time. But I do believe very much that we're in the midst of this history, that we have so much more to do to be a true participatory democracy, right? Like, we used to look at the USSR and say, like, oh my god, they got, like, one party. How crazy is China today? One party, that's crazy. The rest of the world is looking at us and be like, two parties? Really? That's democracy? Like, we just take it for granted that that is a modern democracy. The rest of, I would say, the countries that I look to as maybe further along that pathway that we could learn something from, say, that's insane. And for the most part, I would say, without being critical consumers of where we are in the formation of democracy, where we are in terms of the use of these technologies, we are but serfs in a very non-democratic, non-participatory, prescribed and alienating space. Hi, uh, Doug Ollivant. I, I really like your domestic analogy um, of, you know, a information asymmetry at the day dinner table, but I think we can take that further. Um, so yes, you've, you've got your son sitting at the dinner table, and he can Google what you've asked about, and that reduces the traditional information asymmetry that, uh, that he's had, and therefore that's, that's more empowering for the traditionally less empowered. All right, he can walk out the door, and you can go upstairs and log on to with your Apple ID and click where's my iPhone and because you're paying his bill, he will pop up on the screen. You know where he is 24 hours a day. Um, now I know why I'm becoming president of New America. <laughs> I didn't know that. If you, don't, <laughs> if you don't like where he is, you can send a message through the OS that pops up, you know, come home in 30 minutes or I'm going to you know, punch the wipe all data from this device button. <laughs> yes. um, that's power. That's power. And, you know, then if, you know, you, you can go on the next morning and maybe he's internet savvy enough to make sure that his privacy settings are set on Twitter and Facebook, but n all the, p the, the odds that everyone around him is doing the same things approach zero. So you can pull up them, you can find out what he was doing, where he was. The, you know, the, the, the technological advantage goes to those who have traditional power more than those who are trying uh -huh. to rise up. Uh -huh. 
I'm going to take that as a comment. It's a, it's a great one. Yep. Follows on that. I, I'm, this is, I'm Lisa Guernsey. I direct the Early Education Initiative here, and I'm 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 taken with the idea that you know policymakers are looking in the rearview mirror, and and to me, um, to look ahead, we have to be looking at today's kids and where they're going to be in 10 years, and so I think about you know my my daughters and my family where since five they've been popping on Google whenever they have a question. They they can get information um, on their own, and then they can. Yes, do the same thing you're talking about, Anne Marie. Like, really, you know, we have disputes over what they've found. But they can read what they see on the screen. We have statistics in this country that are mind boggling, where two thirds of children at the end of third grade cannot read at grade level. And we have poverty rates that are one in, one in four for, for uh, children under five. So I'm wondering whether policymakers need to be looking at an intersection of the education and technology spaces to be understanding better what's, what's coming for, for today's society. I'm curious your comments on that. I think that's absolutely true. I think that's where we need to lead people to be seeing those connections. That's a great way to think about looking forward. You think about children, because that's what everybody can get their hands around. And I, I think that's what we often are not doing. And we, there needs to be a concerted effort to get policymakers approaching these issues that, that way. And it seems to me it's, it's, a, it's an embrace the technology, but don't think, it, don't think that's the end. Don't think that solves anything. Don't think you stop there. It's understand it. You could, you could monitor your, your son, and then he could follow you the next day. And over time, there's the power difference, but you know there's also the difference in understanding the technology. And if you don't understand it, you're going to undermine your own power. So this is the struggle. And I think we have to be teaching um, our policymakers to embrace it, understand it, but don't think that that's the end. You now have to put it into the human frame and the frame of how we are, what our culture is, what our history is, and how our society has to use this tool appropriately. So, and just to, to put both of them together, and Doug, on, on your point too, it's interesting, I, I take your point that at least in, in our society in many ways, and this is running through the power discussion, that the, it empowers both, and ultimately though, those who already have power, have, it can, can, their power increases more than those who didn't have power, but now have, have more than they had, but the, the fundamental disparity isn't changed. That's not true in many countries around the world. I mean, if you, th if one of the things that was most striking to me about the Egyptian revolution was talking to Egyptians who said the older generation followed the younger generation because they were used to doing that because the younger generation understood this world so much better than they did. So in other words, just like those of us who follow our kids when they set up whatever digital technology we want them to set up, older Egyptians were willing to follow younger Egyptians in a society that normally would defer to elders because younger Egyptians understood this, this new world. So there's a, there, at least in other parts of the world, I think that that's not uh, necessarily true. But the other point, and this goes again to, to your point about children and to Eric's point, you know, digital natives um, see possibilities that I, that even I, who am sort of a half living in the digital world, just can't imagine. I mean, my son's view of his education is he can go online and find courses and find things that he wants to do that serve him so much better than his high school. Now, there's a problem with that, and given that his high school is still grading him. Uh, but, but on the other hand, his notion of what his lifelong education is, is something I honestly can't even imagine because I you know, education for me was school. So there's there's this this sort of way in which trying to put yourself in the in the shoes of people who who's literally whose scope of what is possible is deeply different than those of us who grew up in a non digital world, and somehow capturing that for policymakers. Yeah, Lenny, and then Kati. When will the new digital age disrupt the two-party oligopoly in the United States? And Sasha, what would you do to accelerate it? Great question. <laughs> well, I think the digital age has already disrupted party politics dramatically. And then when you add on top of that certain Supreme Court decisions related to money in politics, you, you accelerate that process. Um, now, that, uh, that doesn't answer your question is, can there be more than two parties? 
but what there what I think it does answer is there is an, a lot more going on in political activity that has nothing to do with parties, and I think that's very significant. Other responses? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I live in Washington, D.C., so when I want to blow people's brains out, I say, look, my my candidate for president didn't win. And then there's a pause, and they're like, there's no way. How could he possibly? Is he Republican? What's going on? You know, and, and the reality is the problems are not technological, and the technology itself isn't going to overcome. And this is what we learned, we, what we know in Arab Spring. Like, the technology isn't going to bring about revolutionary change. It may be a force multiplier. It may help people activate and organize. But uh, what we're facing here is an entrenched, relatively oppressive system in terms of keeping vast quantities of people from having true representation in our government. And my hope is that the technology helps bring that more to the fore. Uh, but the problem is political, not technological. Or the solutions are going to be political, not technological. Yeah, speaking of older people following younger people in Egypt, um, a, a couple months after Mubarak departed, um, the number of activists got into the state security headquarters uh, outside of Cairo and got into some of the files that were being kept there and found reams and reams of email exchanges, Skype conversations they thought had been secure, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, some of the technology, deep packet inspection technology being used to collect all this information uh, came uh, 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 at least partially from uh, an American company now owned by Boeing called Naris, uh, which has been selling its technology to Egypt and which also supplied the technology used uh, uh, by the NSA in a secret facility at AT&T that was exposed a few years ago. So. So, again, I guess to come back to the whole issue of young people, it is really exciting sort of what they feel they can do and understand. But I've done a fair amount of teaching, um, and I, the one thing I have noticed is, is that while they're very adept at kind of using all the tools, there's actually very little understanding um, of security of kind of what's going on behind the scenes in terms of how these services are managed, in terms of whether there are other possibilities. Like, might you have a social network in which, you know, that has different types of features than what Facebook has? And, you know, if it were different, how would your life be different? You know, they haven't even thought about it, you know? So their, their, their kind of sense of reality and what is possible, it, it's as if, you know, because the air is this way and because buildings are that way, therefore my, you know, I can't imagine a different life. It, it's, I, I think their lives are also sort of circumscribed a little bit, you know, just kind of assuming that this is just the way it is. Uh, and not sort of challenging why is it this way that I, I think is, you know, it still makes sort of older educators relevant, I would Good. say. I'm glad. If I, if I could jump in. Uh, Kati and then Jeff. <laughs> I jump in real quick, actually. Yes, I, I feel, sure. Fundamentally, there's this gulf right now between, like, look, look around this room, right? The wisdom inherent in this room is extraordinary. Now, the technological acumen, <laughs> not so. Right, so you have this gulf, right? It's generational, but it's not purely generational, where you have a lot of wisdom in the world, a lot of acumen, and they don't really overlap. And you can see what happens with this. I hearken back to the classic movie, War Games, right? Young kid breaks in, starts thermonuclear war. It happens to be a video game. But the reality is, like, this is what happens when the acumen and the wisdom aren't in the same spaces. And right now, if, if, if we're worrying, looking around the room, being like, ah, we don't have the highest technical acumen, let me tell you, it's like 100 million, billion, bazillion times more than Congress, which are the ones actually making the decisions and the laws around these technological issues. But New America will change that. Kati. Oh, this is so interesting, Anne-Marie. Can you, um, we, have, we have in uh, real time um, a genocidal uh, slash civil war situation of tremendous consequence unfolding uh, in Syria. Can, uh, can you guys deal with uh, the impact that the digital revolution is having on, on how policymakers are dealing with that and uh, how the people on the ground who are, who are engulfed in that genocide are dealing with it? What difference is it making? 
So it's actually, it's a, I'll, I'll take a crack at this and, and love to hear Eric's uh, thoughts on it. In, in some ways, um, it, it goes to Doug's point about uh, entrenching, giving power and entrenching power at the same time. Because on the one hand, I don't think, this is going to be a really short answer because Jeff wants to, to jump in. I don't think that we would even have, have had the knowledge, we wouldn't have had much of the knowledge we've had to push those who want to do something about Syria unless you'd had the uploading of videos that you've had from the very beginning, right? I mean, the, the, the Syrian government would have been able to say, this is a domestic disturbance and we are putting it down, and that would have been an end to it if you had not been able to see, and we've forgotten now for a solid year, videos constantly, videos of torture, videos of, of demonstrations, videos of people being shot uh, on the, on the uh, streets. At the same time, of course, the Syrian government has very successfully managed to flood the zone in all sorts of ways that are now making it harder and harder to decide who's in the right. I will just say, I think something that would make a huge difference, and I've proposed it, but suppose the UN, backed by the US and other countries, had an, a verified secure space where you could upload videos that would then be actually a confer, affirmed in normal report, uh, reporting ways, right? So you could say, yes, this is an accurate video and it's been verified by the following ways. So that winning the information war would, I think, make it much easier for people to, to push for actual solutions. Because right now you try to say that and they, and they just point out all the other, other information. Much longer conversation, but Jeff, you have the last word. I just wanted to posit something that I've been thinking about, and it, uh, Rachel's uh, comment, made, uh, Rebecca, sorry, made me think about it. Uh, we say, our, isn't it great our kids, since they're three years old and they've grown up using all these instruments, devices, Google, and everything else. Remember, though, they have grown up learning and using all these devices before they knew any, they were educated anything about Magna Carta, civil liberties, that corporations actually aren't, that, that, that there are corporations behind all these things that want to collect data on them, that there are governments that want to collect data on them. Things that we in my generation, as we've become very, pretty, pretty lit literate in all these things, that we wouldn't do, information we would not make available, they do routinely. I talk to my three kids, 29, 24, not 18. They don't care at all about what kind of information they give out. For social security numbers, credit card numbers, they don't have a clue about that. And, and think about even much younger generations. So they, they haven't even read 19, 1984, George Orwell, when they're learning to use these devices. So there's something there that somebody uh, of, the, of those generations, of the younger generation, uh, to try to, and we have to figure out, maybe as part of our education, even, at, even in kindergarten, we need an education program to talk to children about these things because it's a little bit like sex and everything else. If they do it when they're, or driving, if they do it before they have driving lessons, if they do it before they have sex education, there's going to be abuse and, and somebody else is going to abuse them, which is the worst part of it. Final reflections from in, the panel? In, That's a in, in our book, we, we say very clearly that the core problem is that physical maturity occurs later than information maturity. And there's example after example of this, but I think it's a fair statement that parents will figure out that they need to have the data permanence information security talk with their, their kids before they have the sex talk. That's how powerful this issue is. So uh, I'll end on a positive note which is thank God for the education program, right? I mean, when I think about math and science, and when I think about reading and writing and arithmetic, and I'm like, wow, that, that's all good and important and all that. The fact that we don't have digital literacy integrated in from the very, very beginning of our education system. Like, this is something that you will use every day, a lot every day that will impact every facet of the lives of our children. And they are not taught at all. And you have this bizarre scenario whereby we, the older populace that knows math okay and you know 
writing and arithmetic, we're okay at that. Like, we have no technological acumen either. And so you're really starting from a baseline where it's like, how do you infuse that into a society writ large? And that's why I say we're not yet in this digital era. We're on this cusp. And there's a lot of normative questions about what it means to move our society into that space that are unanswered, that our key policymakers aren't addressing, and that we have to look to groups like our education program to figure out what does that look like. Well, that's a great way to end. Uh, so in the new digital age needs a new digital education. And I would say a new set of accountability structures. Uh, and I... This is exactly, frankly, what I think New America does better than anywhere else. I don't think there's anywhere in this town that we could have had this kind of conversation, uh, this wide-ranging, this imaginative, this creative. And let me thank my panel and all of you.